In this lecture, I will talk about uh, network competition and standardization strategies, which are related to the strategic question of how to ignite the positive feedback mechanism inherent in network markets. And as we saw in, in previous lectures, um, the network markets are characterized by system goods. So we have products that are closely related to other products or they have components that they have to be consumed or utilized with. So um, we're looking at technical systems. We're also <coughs> seeing a lot of network effects that, that can be uh, between users. There could be also indirect network effects where those complementary products or compl complementary services become very uh, central to the success of any particular product. And as a result of these um, characteristics, we see lock-in. So we see um, users and also suppliers of these complementary things um, being locked into a, a network market. So it becomes very difficult to start a whole new system, a whole new network, because all the users benefit from other users in the network or they care about the complementary um, goods and, let's say, content or games that they can put on their, on their consoles. Um, and it becomes difficult and very costly. There are high switching costs to switch between different networks. So those are the key characteristics of network um, or, or um, technical systems uh, and network markets. Um, Varian and Shapiro discuss um, sort of generic or really basic strategies that firms can um, employ in trying to penetrate and control network markets. Um, the key uh, choices are between whether to, to make uh, the product compatible with earlier products or whether to start a whole new system. And on the other hand, uh, horizontally, whether to open up the interfaces of the products or, or close and keep a proprietary control system. So let's think about the choice of compatibility. This relates to the backwards um, interoperability of the new product with existing systems and networks and, and products that are um, out there pre-existing. So um, if I decide to build on top of existing networks, then my product will, will be compatible with the, with the other, um, other um, systems and it will be much easier for people to migrate between the old uh, technologies and the new technologies. But that will also likely um, uh, create some um, loss of control of the system. On the other hand, if I have a really substantial innovation and it's completely different from everything that's out there, then um, I might start a, start a new network from scratch. And you can imagine that there are a lot of difficulties in getting a new network off the ground. But if I do succeed in doing that, then I really have a, a proprietary and, uh, and uh, um, completely independent new system. So if you think of something like Skype, they could when they launched, they could have made Skype compatible with existing telephone networks. So um, making possible that people can call from their networks to Skype and from Skype to networks. They actually decided not to do that. So they decided to go with the performance strategy or the non-compatible strategy and uh, start a whole um, brand new network from um, scratch. And, um, if only later on they have started to add these um, capabilities to, to call between telephone and, and Skype networks. So this is a revolution strategy and compatibility on the other, other hand is a more evolutionary strategy. The other set of um, strategic choices relates to the openness. Whether I choose to keep my network um, separate from other kind of peer or competing networks out there so in terms of the Skype example, um, an open network would be a situation where somebody who is a user of Skype could call into another IP telephony network. Um, so internet, um, internet protocol based um, telephone network. So do I build those interfaces? Do I open up my system so that other IP, IP uh, communication networks can call in and out of Skype? Well, they have not done that. They have actually kept a more controlled system. So it, has it is a, a proprietary system and um, you cannot call between different IP networks. 
or you can think of instant messaging networks. Initially, they used to be very separate. So if you were a user of one instant messaging system, you could not message to another uh, instant messaging system. But over time, they have added more, of the, more openness, and now it's, it's possible to, to um, communicate between these networks. So if we put these two choices, the fundamental choices of compatibility, backwards compatibility, and openness, then we end up with this two by two uh, matrix of, of uh, sort of core strategies for network, um, network markets. If we have a, a compatible technology that um, the, the innovator chooses to be, to, to retain um, controlled by themselves, that strategy is called controlled migration. So then it's a migration from an earlier technology. It's easy to migrate between um, previous generation technologies up to this technology, but the innovator keeps it controlled and does not open up horizontally to other systems that are also in the marketplace. If we uh, decide to be compatible with the previous generation, but open up also um, with the competing systems, then we have an open migration strategy making it very easy to um, upgrade from earlier technologies, but also easy to commun communicate across current um, technologies. On the other hand, performance play is a strategy where I choose to start a whole new network from scratch, the performance strategy, combined with the controlled, so no openness of interfaces. Um, and that um, is, a, is the, probably the most tricky strategy um, of all, but it can yield very large payoffs if successful. And the final strategy is discontinuity, where I start a new network. It's non-compatible with previous networks, previous products and services, but it's open. I allow competitors to um, build off of that, um, that innovation in the horizontal marketplace. And the key issues and the key challenges in launching a network product, product um, with these uh, different strategies is related to um, dealing or managing the switching costs and the fears of lock-in. So as we discussed earlier, when we have a network and there's network effects and um, system goods, uh, users will face high switching costs. It will be difficult after they have adopted one system to actually jump into, jump into another one. So they're locked into this, the um, product or network that they initially buy. And the cost of changing will be substantial. So in the performance play strategy, um, when you start a new network that's controlled, these fears will be the most pronounced. It's likely, and users will know this, it's likely that uh, it will become a monopoly network. There will be one company that controls the, the whole network, <coughs> and they expect to face high prices and um, uh, be kind of uh, stuck with their choices um, going down, down the line. So it will be very important for the innovator to make it easy to, for, for users to switch into this. So they'll try to provide incentives and make the switching path, path as easy as possible. In controlled migration, um, the uh, lock-in um, issue will be also um, very, very pertinent. So um, an innovator needs to probably um, uh, set up alliances or, or um, similar arrangements to try to um, help users understand that they will not be necessarily um, subjected to monopoly pricing in the future. Open migration is a strategy that users will like the most. So it's, it's open, there will be a lot of competition, prices will be um, driven lower than in the controlled or in the monopoly situation. And it's also easy to migrate from earlier technologies into the new one. So users love this. But then um, sometimes it's still difficult to get the, the demand going and, and um, firms are probably, probably benefit from strategies that, that uh, where they coordinate and cooperate with peers in trying to get the whole um, marketplace to adopt and, and upgrade to the new technologies. 
um, firms will also need to develop additional advantages such as um, manufacturing assets or really good distribution channels or something else in addition to the core technology because there will be a lot of competition. Because of the openness there will be a lot of entry um, and it will be rich and, and um, easily it's much easier to grow this market but um, that's also a tougher competitive situation in, um, further in, in, into the future. Discontinuity um, was the strategy where you start a whole new network, but you open it up. And this opening up will reduce some of these fears of, of monopoly pricing in the future. But it will still be um, important to think about how, what will induce users to switch and what will, how can the innovator uh, facilitate the switching from the earlier um, technology to, to the current or the new one. So switching cost will still be between the um, past, past technologies and the current one. That will be a, a, a strategic concern. I'll talk a little bit about standards and standardization strategies next. So um, standards are technical specifications that are really important in, in uh, network markets and communication systems. And that those uh, specifications define how information is passed through the system, how it sort of is communicated from one party in the system to another party. And standards would allow um, uh, standardization of interfaces so that my telephone will be able to actually communicate with the um, telephone or cell phone of, um, of another user. Um, and these kind of kinds of standards or the specifications can be open or proprietary. An open standard would be um, technical details that are often even downloadable from the, from the internet and um, anyone who wants to build a, a product based on the standard is able to do so. So that's an open standard. The, the specifications are available to everybody. On the other hand, proprietary standards are, um, are technical systems where somebody is able to control those interfaces. They may be still standardized, they may be, may be well defined, but some, there's a, there's a um, a business party who can decide who gets to apply the standard and, and build for the interface. Standardization um, is then a really kind of a key technical aspect of, of interoperability between products and, and between systems. And there are usually great benefits um, for both the suppliers and for users um, from standardization. If you have a standardized system, it's much easier for the, the network effects to take off it's easier to reach the critical mass and, and beyond and really um, realize the value of the network for both users and suppliers. So there's a strong uh, social benefit from standardization. Proprietary standards, on the other hand, when there's somebody who can control the standard and control the system and how it's, it's growing, um, can reap great um, b uh, business and, and, and um, financial benefits from from uh, being able to control its, its growth. And so if that person is successful or that um, company is successful and they grow this network <coughs> large enough to reach critical mass and beyond and it takes off, then being able to control the interfaces and charge people. You have a successful network and people will want to join in. You can charge for access. You can decide which kinds of um, partners or, or um, parties can join the network and that can be a very, very profitable business business model. Open standards, on the other hand, um, typically it's harder to, to derive um, profits uh, directly from the standard or, or directly from the uh, control of the system because you can't control it by definition, you open it up. Um, but then there are benefits from that, that growth of the marketplace. <coughs> standards can be set in, in a number of different ways and sometimes they have the, the three main ways are, are a little bit um, mixed. You see elements of, of um, multiple ways to set standards. Um, the costliest and riskiest way to set, set standards is the standards war. So this is a situation where there's uh, two or more parties or products or systems that are head-to-head -head competing for the marketplace. They know that the market is likely to tip and so um, they each want to win the market. They have to make uh, great investments, there's a lot of uncertainty. The market, it will be slow to take off because users will be reluctant to join this, this battle and 
they don't because they don't know which side will win. And um, eventually, one or the other will likely um, win or lose, and and um, and th that losing side will actually lose the value of all or most of their investments. So that's a very risky situation. Um, and indeed, we see more and more cooperative standardization. So this is a um, cooperative. So you have uh, cooperative structures. Uh, let's say alliances or standard setting organizations or consortia um, uh, within industries where companies that can be direct competitors, they get together, sit down at a table and, and try to negotiate um, those specifications one by one. And the third way to set standards is really um, just having a standards leader in the market. This might be the large, largest firm or it might be um, an earlier innovator who has really been able to create a large uh, network. And just by um, the fact of being the leader in the market, they set the standards and they control, potentially control the standards and control the network. And um, this is a kind of a natural evolution. Nobody really designs it, but um, some party or perhaps an alliance will become the standard leader without having to go to war or without having to negotiate with other players. Um, an added complication, however, in setting standards is intellectual property. So we see more and more um, patenting by um, companies innovating in communication technologies, and um, they try to sneak their patents, uh, perhaps other forms of intellectual property, into the standards definitions. And so this is a um, tricky situation when um, but even if you create an open standard, it's available for everybody to, to download and utilize. But if you build products, then you have to go and license specific patents, standard essential patents from um, competitors in the marketplace. Um, and it all sounds fine, and there are mechanisms that make companies actually commit to licensing. They commit to the openness of the standard, and they commit to licensing but there are no ways to force them to charge a particular price for those patents. So sometimes um, com companies who build um, products for the standard will end up being kind of held hostage um, for, standards, um, for licensing negotiations. So just to summarize um, the network strategies and standardization, um, network strategies involve choices between compatibility and control. So whether to make the system compatible with earlier technologies or not, and whether to control the technology horizontally or whether to open up to other players in the marketplace. And they have very different implications for how competition evolves over time in that, um, in that industry. Standards are a way um, to create interoperability, either backwards compatibility or ho uh, horizontal um, openness and, and um, and um, interoperability to other systems in the market. Um, and they can enhance the value of the network and they can sometimes create great benefits for both suppliers and, and users. But um, they, can be, they can be risky if, if uh, a company ends up in a standards war that can be very uh, detrimental to their performance or c could be very risky and, and uncertain. Um, and uh, we see a lot of cooperative standards, cooperative standard setting, which, um, in, which, which can be very slow and tedious and kind of tug of war with, between competitors, but um, then they are more likely to, um, more, um, with, a, with a larger front, build up the marketplace and enhance demand in that way.